My name is Steven Weber. I am the Director of Music Technology Innovation uh, at Berklee College of Music here in Valencia, Spain. We are actually located uh, right here in this facility. I didn't have to leave the building to get over here today. Um, we're just pleased as punch to be here. I'm living here in Valencia now and just absolutely loving it. Um, I want to talk to you today about inventing the album of 2025. Uh, that's not too far in the future, just 12 years or so from now. But I think that we need to reinvent this, but before we do, we need to decide what we're talking about. So first off, let's, let's talk about what is an album. Now, when I talk to my students about this and when I travel around and, and talk to audiences, or when I work with artists, and I, I've, I've worked with many, many artists producing and or engineering over a, a hundred records so far. Um, pretty much everybody agrees that an album is a collection of songs. That's, that's pretty much agreed upon. But there seems to also be something else there. There needs to be some sort of artistic cohesion that keeps this album together. It's just not a random grouping of songs, but there needs to be some thought process behind that. And the best albums, the albums that, that really are, are artistically most satisfying, seem to also take us on a journey. Um, they tell us a story, just like any kind of Western art uh, that happens over a timeline. They may have a, a climax, they rise and fall, and they take us from, from somewhere to somewhere else. And often what also comes up, actually every time what comes up, is that there is also a visual component to an album. Whether this is a stereo LP or something else, that there's got to be something visual about it as well. Um, I think it's actually a good question as to why we call it an album in the first place. And it used to really bother me when CDs came out and people would come on talk shows to promote their album uh, that they would say, oh, I have a new album out, and then Jay Leno or somebody else would say, oh, it's not an album, it's a CD, and they would say, oh, well, whatever. But it's not a CD. There's nothing about a vinyl record that was an album. In fact, we call it an album because the very first albums were actually just like photo albums. They were leather bound, and they could hold together a bunch of records at the same time, and you just put the records in the sleeves, and that's why it's called an album in the first place. It's just because it used to be like a photo album. In the 1940s, uh, we put these things together into boxes and sold them that way. Uh, in the 1950s, finally the LPs came out, and LP stands for Long Play. How many people actually remember Long Play vinyl records? How many people actually still listen to Long Play vinyl records? Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, me too. Um, in the 1960s, we came up with the Stereo LP. Now, Stereo had actually been around since 1931, when Alan Bloomline made the first Stereo recordings. But EMI, who he worked for, actually let the patent expire 25 years later because they saw no commercial application for Stereo. So hold on to your patents. Um, by 1969, Stereo LPs had become the standard, and they had become an art form. And interestingly enough, a lot of the best work in terms of that format, the stereo LP, two sides of about 20 minutes, some cool graphics, uh, happened really in the beginning, in the first few years, when artists were really excited and turned on by this new canvas that they had to pour their art into. Now, later came the compact disc era, and a lot of people are, are a little surprised to find out that compact discs actually were introduced in 1979. When I ask college students, often they think that they maybe were invented in, or came about in the late 80s or the mid 80s, but it was really 1979 that they were introduced, and they be actually became the standard very, very swiftly because Philips and Sony both agreed on this new standard and they were able to get record companies on board really quickly. Interestingly enough, 1979 was also when Betamax and VHS was introduced. How many of you still listen to or play movies on VHS or Betamax? There's one guy over there. That's one, okay. 
a couple. Not so many, not so many. In short, the CD is a digital technology that predates Reagan and Gorbachev. Now, some of my students' reaction to this is, who the hell are Reagan and Gorbachev? But to me, it's just kind of baffling to think that we're still distributing, on any kind of scale, a digital technology that predates Reagan and Gorbachev. Before the CD, the average lifespan of a standard was 11 years. That goes all the way back to uh, Thomas Edison in wax cylinders. And the CD has been promoted as a standard for 30 years, which is a problem. So let's talk about why CDs need to die. They're doing a pretty good job of dying, but let's just see if we can speed this along a little bit, shall we? First off, not everything that was invented in 1979 was all that good. The Ford Mustang sucked that year. Um, the other thing is, this is, this is 20 th 2013. Why should anybody pay any amount of money for 700 megabytes of anything at this point? It's ridiculous. The second thing is this lousy packaging. I, I gotta admit, I have never been a fan of the CD. Has this ever happened to you? You buy a brand new CD, you're really looking forward to listening to it, you take it home, you try to open the damn thing up, and it breaks. Has that happened to you? Lousy packaging. Diversity of product is essential, and I think that's the most important thing that we need to learn about. Um, I didn't need an iPhone 5. But I've had an iPhone 3 and I've had an iPhone 4. Now, I'm probably not going to get the fancy new color iPhone 5, but I'll probably get the iPhone 6. Apple is one company, as well as many others, that realize that diversity of product is incredibly important. And the fact that the CD is still around, being promoted as somewhat of a standard by the major labels, is definitely a problem. So why did the CD last so long? Unfortunately, it's not because it's a great format, but it's actually more just because of the economics. If you take a look at CD sales from the last decades that it has been in existence, you'll find that most CD sales were actually legacy catalog. People rebuying their Beatles albums and their Eagles albums and their Michael Jackson albums. Most of the rest was actually just a few big megastars. In the 90s, it was the Garth Brookses and the Madonnas. And then that left very, very little for all other artists. So basically what happened, unfortunately, were the record labels stopped being music companies and started to be plastic distribution companies because it was just so easy to keep printing up more of the legacy catalog. So, there was lots of incentive to keep the party going and no incentive to innovate. So, along comes the MP3 era. Started out by Napster, and many people have said many things about Napster, but I think the one thing that we can all agree on is that Napster proved that stereo audio files were essentially indefensible. And one of the main tenets of any kind of ownership, whether it's you're driving around in Spain and you see, see castles on the hill where, where kings would, would try to defend their land, or whether it's intellectual property, is that if you cannot defend your property, saying that you own it is really just an academic exercise. Stereo audiophiles are no longer defensible, and therefore I would say that saying that you own them is just an exercise in futility. In 2001, of course, Apple makes downloading legal, and the record labels embraced this new standard, but they didn't really. The record companies embraced the new standard about the way that uh, an eight-year-old kid embraces eating green beans. They were not very happy about it, and they fought it tooth and nail. And in fact, they kept the CD alive as much as they could in addition to Apple's new product, and therefore, they really didn't let it become a new standard. And now, it's actually on the decline because we've moved on to streaming services such as Spotify. But what the iPod did is it returned us to a singles market. 
So you've really kind of got to ask yourself at this point, is there still a reason for the album to exist? And we're at a juncture now where it seems to be almost extinct. And it very well may be about to go the way of the dodo bird. But as I talk to artists that I work with, and I talk to my students, and I talk to folks in seminars all over the world, everybody seems to think that it's worth keeping around. It's creatively stimulating. Uh, it's a significant longer art form. Not everything can be crammed into three and a half minutes and, and put onto a YouTube video. And as we said, diversity of product is key to survival. And the excitement that surrounds a new format that artists can get their hands around can really invigorate an industry. So, the current situation, basically we have a digitally vulnerable product, we have an unsexy physical product, and we have an industry in the recorded music industry that is, as Frank Zappa would say, not necessarily dead, but it definitely smells funny at this point. So, let's invent the future, shall we? Often, technology innovation is not just the newest, latest and greatest thing, but it's taking stuff that's already possible and putting it together in a new way, like many of the presentations that we just saw. New interest in older ideas, but putting them together in a way that's really exciting for people. So, Let's ask, what is, what is possible at this point? And there's a lot. We have, obviously, new canvases, which we've talked about quite a bit today, and, and most people are sporting some sort of new canvas with them at this, at this uh, event right now. Artists are making great use of these canvases. Uh, Bjork, in her Bilophilia album that she released as an app, was astonishing, and it was a successful product. And basically every single song had a different kind of game that you could play. Everything was very interactive. There was different ways to experience the music visually. But unfortunately, what's going on here is we are making artists become CEOs of their own small tech startups just to create something. So let's see what else is possible. Multi-channel audio systems are out there now. Um, these have been out for quite a while. And there's a bigger quality gain when you do blindfold tests, as Tom Holtzman of the THX spec has done many, many times with, with large swaths of the public. They, they actually perceive a much larger increase in quality between, say, stereo and 5.1 surround than they do between mono and stereo. When people hear it, they love it. And at this point, there are millions and millions of these systems installed but there's no specific music format for these devices. There's also immersive environments, uh, which, which games have in spades, where you, can, where you can really get lost inside of something for a long period of time and really explore. We also have interactivity. And so many of the artists that I work with these days, the younger artists especially, are very, very savvy about using the internet, using Facebook, using Twitter, using Vine, to interact with their fans, and there's many ways to interact at this point. Obviously, high-definition video is all over the place, even in 3D. So what might this look like? If we were going to add, say, video to the album of the future, what might that look like? Well, in terms of visuals, yeah, let's start with interactive, um, uh, immersive environments that are totally unique something that's just totally unique to that particular project that when you put it on, you get totally lost in it. Um, how many of you guys remember all the way back to when Mist first came out? Do you remember Mist? Few people do. I remember putting on Mist, and a bunch of my musician and producer fans and friends too, we, we got lost in this thing and we thought, this is what the album of the future is gonna look like. This is going to have, we're going to forget about a little CD booklet or even a, a, an iTunes album with a lousy, you know, PDF of a, of a CD booklet. Let's, let's really get into something that looks great. Performance videos of every song. People hear with their eyes. I believe that at this point in history, every time we set up a microphone, we should be setting up a camera as well. 
So if the, if, if the fan wants to watch the bass player play the song one time, they can do that. If they want to watch the singer play the song, they can do that. If they want to watch the drummer play the song, they can certainly do that. This can be big budget stuff if you have the, the budget to spend, or it could be low budget stuff because there's so many ways to shoot video incredibly inexpensively these days. Video diary from the artist. Um, like I said, I've, I've produced and or engineered over 100 records, and I guarantee you that most artists are narcissistic enough that this will not be a problem. Most artists will embrace this wholeheartedly. The chance to talk into a camera every single day about what it is they're doing, believe me, they're going to be right there. Scripted videos of the singles, uh, we're already doing this now, but this should be a part of the album. This should be part of what you buy. And then tons and tons of behind-the-scenes making of content. About a year ago, I was visiting my parents in New York, and I, and I went out to, they're getting on in age, so I went out to, to get something for us to, to do together, something to, to listen to or watch. And I was at the store, at, at the cash register there, and there were two things sitting next to each other. One was an Adele record. It was 700 glorious megabytes of Adele. And right next to that was Toy Story 3. And for the same price, you could buy 700 megabytes of Adele, or you could buy the DVD and the Blu-ray, and two other discs full of behind-the-scenes content, games to play, all sorts of stuff to do. It just made no sense to me that the recorded music industry was so far behind the times. So we see that the possibilities are really infinite. But that's the problem. Because in the words of Orson Welles, the absence of limitations is the enemy of art. What do I mean by this? If you can paint anything, how the hell do you decide what you're going to paint? If you can do literally anything, you're probably going to have to spend most of your time just defining the canvas in the first place. So, what I believe we need to do is break free of the past and create a new standard that will allow artists to pour their art into this. A blank canvas that artists don't have to invent each time, but they can get busy making music, talking about it, being compelling artists, and with their producers, they can turn it into something that we'll all want to see. So, let's just try looking at what a focused feature set might look like. And this is just, this is just my spitballing here, although I spitballed yesterday, so I, I actually can put it up on the screen. But this could be almost anything. But let's, let's think about it. Okay, music. Stereo. You buy this thing and it sends stereo to all your devices whether it's in your pocket, or whether it's in your car, or whether it's in your home. Multi-channel surround sound. So for those who are really audiophiles and want to geek out about that, they can get that. Stems to remix. A lot of bands, Nine Inch Nails and others, have put out their stems, which means they put out their drum tracks, and their bass tracks, and their keyboard tracks, and their guitar tracks, so that the fans can actually remix these things. They can join an online community where they have contests about who remixed them best and have all sorts of interactivity with the music itself. Visuals, basically all the stuff we just said, plus probably 50 high-res pictures. Interactivity, every time you buy an album, you should have a private social media feed that gives you an online community of people limited to those who have bought this record. And there could be all sorts of VIP offers when the artist is touring that you'll get first crack at buying tickets. Maybe you'll be able to be invited to meet and greets, come backstage. The artist can be interacting with this online community of fans that have bought their record and, and, and are supporting them. And so this can add a lot of value to buying this product. I think it should be both physical and virtual. I'm amazed when I do workshops on this how many people really feel like it needs to be a physical product. But I think that if you buy either, you should get both. If you buy the physical product in the store, you automatically get it online, and if you buy it online, we mail you the physical product. Now, there's a lot of people that think the album is just done. It's not going to be easy 
to convince people that it's not and that we should create some sort of new standard. But I really believe that what's happened is that technology and the art and the econ economics of it have just gotten out of sync with each other and that we can actually get these things back together again. And many say it's crazy, but in the words of Steve Jobs, those who are crazy enough to think they can change the world usually do. Thank you very much.